Good evening, We Buy Black Family. Welcome to New Africa August. My name is Dewan Hopo, and this evening we have a very, 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 very special guest. I want to introduce Mr. Philip Yates. Philip, how are you today, sir? I'm doing well. Doing well, Dewan. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, We Buy Black, for having me. And hello, We Buy Black Family. Hope you're doing all right out there. So, first of all, Philip, you you are first of all an inspiration. Um, what what do you do? Just just start up. What do you do for a living, Philip? Oh, man, besides being um, Harper and PJ's dad and Chelsea's <laughs> husband, which is my full time job, okay. I'm an attorney. I'm an, I'm an attorney. I, do, I practice uh, business law for the most part. I mm -hmm. do some bankruptcy and some other areas of law, but majority of my client clients are entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, so on a yeah. day to day basis, I try to help people um, grow, protect. In their assets. Now, you do realize that when a black man like yourself says, you know, I'm a business attorney, people look at you funny because, it, you know, that's not something we, right? That, that's not what we're used to hearing every day. So I, I got to ask you, how did you get into that line of work? I mean, that's, that's fascinating. How did you get into that? Yeah, no, you bring up a good point. I'll say a lot of my colleagues, um, they did go other, other routes and, you know, they're successful in, in their own um, right. But a lot of them didn't choose bankruptcy, uh, business law or bankruptcy for that matter, just because it's just not something that is taught to us in terms of securities and, and corporate law and things of that nature. Um, for me, I'll, I've always had a passion for the law. I've always had a passion for business. Um, and in fact, uh, roughly about 10 years ago, I started working with the Houston Area Urban League, and I helped them start their small business program uh, in, in their entrepreneurship center in, in the Houston area. And so over time, I've seen upwards of five, you know, maybe 6,000 entrepreneurs go through this process. Wow. And, you know, after, after a decade, you see people not only start, but you see people start hitting, getting some wins. And, and I noticed that there is, there is a need for having an advisor that is an attorney. Uh, and so I've been happy to, to fill that space, not only for those that I've, I've met through that journey, but for others in, in, the, in the entrepreneurship space. I, I have not talked to 5,000 entrepreneurs in my life. <laughs> You've talked to <laughs> That's a lot of people, man. I mean, that, that is, and you seem like you still want to do this. You seem energized by this. Like you, you like interacting with entrepreneurs. That's okay. So, but, but I want to challenge you a little bit more. So okay. where, where are you originally from? I'm from A-Leaf, Texas. And so that's Houston, uh, southwest part of Houston, born and raised. And I'll say you know, by virtue, uh, also Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, because sure. most of my, okay. Yeah, most of my, all, well, all my family's from Pittsburgh, outside of my sister and myself. Um, so I'll say those are my two homes. Um, yeah, it, mom and dad, both born and raised there. Dad is a corporate banker. And so that was the, the first opportunity for me to see entrepreneurs and, and see uh, just that, that business space as a whole. And then my mom, um, she always wanted me to create something that I had a passion for. That's what she always kind of instilled in me, like, do something that's going to help people and make sure you have a passion. And that's how I fell in love with the law. And then by way of entrepreneurship, giving you the, all the tools and resources um, to solve problems, that's how I ended up here. Uh, so it's really about based on having parents that push me in that direction. So was there a day that you woke up and said, you know what, I, I really, really want to do this business loss? Was there a day or was, there, was it a, a sort of journey? Like, how, again, how do you get into this? Yeah, um, it was definitely in my 20s, right? Uh, when, I, when I came, I, I didn't say that earlier, but I also have an MBA background. So that's, I was inter once I knew that I wanted to be in business and that I wanted to be in law, I kind of went that path, get an MBA, understand business. I did corporate America for a short term. And then I actually started my own insurance agency. And so I had a farmer's franchise that I, I operated for about three years, did well, but I didn't do as well as I like. And that's and not only because it wasn't my passion, but I was missing something. And one and some of those things were advisors and mentors. And so one of those key people that I wish were in my life was a business attorney that could have advised me from the very beginning how to set up my organization, things I should do when I hire employees, um, and really just having a better outlook on where my business was going so that I, I could plan properly and maybe limit or mitigate some of the, the risk and liabilities that come with the entrepreneur. From there, I took a quick pivot, and that's when I got to start working for our Urban League. And it was the same thing. You're seeing all these people who are, are pretty much 
laying it all on the line. They're investing in, into their hopes, their dreams, and, and trying to create a better life and create wealth for themselves. And they're all needing an advisor. And what better way to serve as that advisor than being an attorney? An attorney gave me that tool and resources to be somebody's advisor to help them accomplish their dream and then help them protect it. And so that's, it was really through my own self, my own personal experience, but then also that experience of others and saying, what can I do to make sure they accomplish their dreams? Okay, cool. You said back in my twenties and as someone, you know, looking at your hairline, I'm like, you know, I, I, you know, don't complain about being old now because I don't, I don't have any hair, but let me, let me ask you this. You talk about being an attorney, like most of us, I mean, let's just be real. Most black people, when we think about an attorney that that seems out of reach and that seems costly, right? That seems expensive. You see it differently. You would say, you know, you're actually missing out on money because you don't have an attorney. So tell us about how much money black entrepreneurs are missing out on because they don't have the appropriate representation. You, you see that differently. Yeah, I do. Um, and I get it all the time, especially in the beginning phases. Uh, people say, you know what? Um, I can't afford you. And I say, and I tell them, yes, you can. I'll work with you. So there's attorneys out there that will work with you if they believe in your vision or they believe that you're, if you can inspire them, just like any other partner that you, you decide to bring on, on your team. Um, I see it as an investment to your business that you, you can't afford not to make. There's so many things or, that you just don't know about the journey of entrepreneurship. There's so many nuances. And it's not that you can go out there and learn them. It's not your job to know. If you're an entrepreneur, it's your job to create value and then make a profit and then be able to retain and, and that profit and protect it, either for your stakeholders or for your family. And the only way you can do that is if you have proper people around you insulating and, and, and an attorney just happens to be one of those people. And it starts from the very beginning from even how you set up the structure of your business, Dewan. Um, you, you talk about losing money. I will say that if you have the proper structure of your business, and let's say you were doing procurement contracts or doing business with the government, they have over $500 billion of government contracts federally. That's not even including on a state, local, or county level. But you can't qualify for those contracts unless you have everything in order. Uh, when you go for the, uh, the United States Small Business Administration or one of the other entities that may help you secure one of those contracts, they're going to say, um, or, did you properly, uh, did you establish the proper entity? Which meaning that you need a limited liability company or a C Corp or one of the other entities um, that they may look at as a deem um, or validate. Um, they ask, do you have a company operating agreement? Do you have, um, you have documentation on every partner that's a part of the business? Um, they're going to know about all the contracts uh, and they're going to know about your intellectual property. They want to make sure that you have taxes. I mean, it's things like that, that if you don't have them in order and you don't have a lawyer to maybe assist you or remind you of that checklist, you'll have trouble down the, uh, down the road. And we saw that even with this pandemic where the, the United States Congress came up with the relief package and they had the Paycheck Protection Program. And you, 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 you know, we read the news like I have and there's been a lot of claims that minorities or some businesses were, didn't qualify for it. And a lot of that was maybe due to, um, you know, no fault of, you know, the, the minority or the, the, the entrepreneur, but a lot of it was due to just not having the capacity to qualify for those contracts. And a lot of that deals with having a lawyer, a CPA, a tax advisor, and a banker to make sure that you're properly situated. So make that investment up front so that you're prepared for the opportunity later on down the road. When you, when you say that, my mind just went somewhere totally different. I'm thinking about like, man, for the average dude on the street, when you say you gotta have this together, you gotta have this together, you gotta have this together. Honestly, a lot of us just think, you know what, these are barriers that were set up to keep us out. These are a bunch of things that were set up so that black folks wouldn't have access to that and the other. And as I think about that, someone like you, a black business attorney, is the greatest civil rights weapon in the world. I mean, it, like, it, it just kind of hit me, like, here are all these things, true or not, at least the perception is, at least people think, like, these are things that you put in front of me, roadblocks as barriers to keep me out the game. And here comes somebody like you as an attorney saying, no, 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 I can get you back. I mean, you're a freedom fighter in a different way. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in those terms, but you really are. I mean, you, <laughs> I don't know. That's just a, a fascinating thought in a book you should write. <laughs> I like that. Let me, hold on. Can, can I write that down real quick? <laughs> yeah. Can I, yeah. I need you to release the, release the rights to that so that yeah. I own intellectual property. <laughs> no, but you're, you're, you're actually right, Duan. Um, I do feel like I have a responsibility, not only as a licensed attorney, um, mm -hmm. federally and state, but to my community. Um, when you're a black attorney, 
because there's not very many black attorneys in, in any any community in any right, whether it's criminal law, family law, um, you know, in, in intellectual property, whatever it is, there's just not a lot of us. We have a responsibility to our community to make sure that we do our best mm -hmm. and, and work zealously for our clients because that's one of the things we haven't been introduced to the game, the rules of creating wealth, the rules of passing down wealth from generation to generation. And every lawyer, especially as a corporate attorney or somebody who understands the law, I understand how to read those laws and make it work to your benefit. And if you don't have somebody that you can trust, it's going to protect you, protect your assets, somebody you can, you feel comfortable sharing it. And that's another, you, you may not feel comfortable with somebody who doesn't look like you. Like you and I can joke around right now because we are, we probably just, we, we have, well, we have the same background. I mean, although, you know, we're not, we didn't grow up the same community, but we understand we have, we have the cultural similarities that we can relate and that makes it easier. Like their good old boy network, we have our own good old boy network. And I feel like that's my responsibility to, become an advisor. And that's why I say I'm an business attorney, but I'm really an advisor to people. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm your board member, you know, without being your board member who owns uh, interest in your company. And whether I do or I don't, I am your advisor. And I should be the person you talk to every single day about every single thought that you're considering because I can help you become wealthy and because I understand the rules. And so, yeah, in terms of being a freedom fighter, I think we're the, we're the, we're the gatekeepers of the next civil rights movement, which is economic freedom. Yeah, and, and to that point, I mean, if you think about it, back in the day, it was about the NAACP Legal Defense Fund taking these, the few talented black lawyers we had to say, let's break down these barriers of, you know, maybe a segregation or whatever, so that there's some access. And the next chapter is, you know, beyond access, there's actually actualizing, right? Let's actually get some stuff. And so in that sense, you need an attorney once again to go in and fight some of those battles. Again, uh, we'll collab on the book later, but you, you sort of started talking about some of the things that you do. Let's expand it. Let's talk about routine things that entrepreneurs need an attorney to do that you would do in your normal day to day. Walk me through some of those just routine things that we, you maybe you don't even think about that would really be beneficial. Yeah, um, at the very beginning phase, because you have two you have two stages. You have your startup um, entrepreneurs or startup small businesses or people in the beginning phases, and then you have your more established or existing businesses. And so for my startup business owners, it's really sitting down with them and helping them um, put their thoughts down on paper where they're trying to go. Uh, it, it's, it's getting them to understand that they need to have the proper business model set up and they need to understand um, the market they're going into so that we understand the liabilities that may come along with that, the cost of doing business. Also, it's helping them create agreements with everybody they interact with. You know, you asked something earlier, you said, you know, for those who believe they can't afford an attorney, um, they might ask themselves, well, I don't need an attorney yet. That's what I always get. When should I need an attorney? And I'll tell people, it's the first time you have an interaction with another person is when you need an attorney, whether that's a partner, whether that's somebody you're doing a contract with, or that's in a consumer, you need an attorney at that time to walk you through that process to get your initial um, employment agreements or your contracts or your operating agreement, depending on the company. Um, so that's that's what a day-to-day -day will look like with a startup because you're really trying to help them build that vehicle so that they can operate in that space. And like you said, actualize your dream. I'm not trying to get you just to be um, in business. So for, you know, when I was growing up, a lot of people in my family, our community, we checked off the being in business mark by just getting a DBA. I remember just always hearing, I got a DBA, I'm in business, and we celebrated that. And it, it was cause for celebrating because we took the next step. And like you said, in that journey, but we're in 2020 now, it's not, we're not talking about just showing up. We're talking about being a part of the economy. We're talking about doing business and actually making an impact. And in order to do that, you got to make sure that we have the proper vehicles and we have the capacity to go on this journey. And so that's, that's, that's the first step, really just um, honing in and making sure they have the proper vehicle. Then you have your businesses that have, uh, are in existence, let's say, over three years plus. A lot of commercial agreements, um, making sure your intellectual property is uh, tightened up. Um, that's important. Uh, I think I should have said that at, at the beginning phases. You want to make sure that you own your, your, your name. You want to make sure you own your logo. You want to make sure you own all the different sayings that you want to use. You want to make sure that there's nothing that can stop that, that, that vehicle from moving down the journey. And intellectual property is another one. Commercial agreements. Uh, everybody you're doing business with, uh, we want to make sure that you have contracts that you understand the expectation of the person you're in business with. And you want to make sure they understand your expectations. Um, that 
that prevents lawsuits. I mean, if everything's in writing and you have a lawyer at the table with you, they can um, help you um, really get through that whole negotiation process, then basically there's a good understanding on what that person's supposed to do. And the only time you should take them to court is if that person breaches the contract or whatnot, and, or they don't, um, they don't satisfy their, their end of the bargain. Um, then it goes into some people, once you start to grow, there's acquisitions. I mean, once you grow, your, your goal is to try to grow your assets and grow in value. And your market's going to get so big that you should start looking at, should I acquire another company? Um, should I buy somebody's intellectual property? Do I want to be acquired? Do I want to sell off my assets? And you'll need a, a lawyer to really go through that due diligence process. Going back to that question, when do I need a lawyer? I have some clients that have been in business for years, over 10 years, on it, and they still have that same mentality. And I, I have one recently, he's a, it's an IT business, and they were looking at acquiring a company. They didn't bring me on until the end. They, they, I guess somebody finally, a light went off on one of their advisors said, let's call our lawyer. They called me up, this deal's almost done, and they kind of give it to me as if it's like a last minute checklist. Let's just make sure yeah. our lawyer does it. I look over and say, have y'all have y'all checked these tax records? Did y'all look at the financials? Did y'all um did, did y'all did, have y'all made a determination even if if all the owners are willing to sign the agreement? And I had this long list of questions. And then so they said, oh, good questions, Phil. And so we sent it over um to the, the company they're trying to purchase and it go, it just stalls. Two weeks later, the company backs out. And it was almost like that's the reason why you need your lawyer. Uh, it's, it's it's a it's a it's an investment. But there's a reason why. It's our job to protect you, protect your assets, preserve your wealth, and make it so that you continue going down the right road. Um, and, and it's fun. It varies, man. I'm telling you, it varies based on the entrepreneur, but it varies on the business, um, and it varies based on the problem at, at, at that time. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's fascinating in this discussion is that, like you said, you, you're free to follow, you're opening up doors. Because there's so many things that we don't know. And, and I include myself in that we. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and I just don't know a lot of stuff, but in business, one of the things that you come across a lot is regulations, right? There are regulations, there, there's rules to every game, right? You interacted with thousands of entrepreneurs. There's some common misconceptions out there about regulations and the rules. What, give me some of the top 10, give me some of these common misconceptions that black entrepreneurs have that you can disabuse them of. The top one is the top. Top misconception, I would say, is that they don't know there's a cost of being in business. So the time you you go to the Secretary of State, you register your business, there's a cost to that. And so I feel like it's like an out of sight, out of mind thing. You mm -hmm. know, so when you, you feel like you don't have to respond to the state and you don't have to respond to the IRS, and it's taxes. Um, and, and that's the biggest one. For some reason, people fail to pay their taxes. They feel like, okay, really, uh, this is just a license for me to do business. And then I'm making transactions with the consumer. And as long as I'm good with the consumer, then I'm okay. And then sometimes we wait till it's too late. And so that'll be the first one, making sure that, um, you know, they understand there's a state and federal. Uh, two, that just every industry is regulated. Um, and, and that's why when I told you with, with the startup, I try to have a really in-depth discussion in terms of their business model and really understanding what their value proposition is and how they're going to generate revenue because I need to know what industry you're going into so that we can fully flesh out what are the regulations pertaining to that specific industry. And I don't think business owners necessarily understand that that's the government's responsibility. They regulate industries not only so they can make money, but so they can protect the economy. Third is every consumer is protected based on where you're, how you're doing business. And so when you talk about regulations, there's a way that you can sell, to, there's a way you can sell online. There's a way you, there's a, there's a, there's, that, that's regulated, it's regulated. Um, the interaction that you have with customers face-to-face, -face, it's regulated. Um, social media is regulated, how to collect the debt. I mean, everything's regulated from the time you, you start to bring awareness to the product or service that you're trying to bring to the market, all the way to when you, make a sale to even when you're trying to collect payment and even trying to collect the debt, it's all regulated by either state or federal government. And so you don't have a pass by saying, okay, I just didn't know, or I wasn't ready to hire a lawyer because it was too soon and I was still trying to understand my business. No, you're held to a certain level of responsibility. So that's really the message I think as entrepreneurs, especially all of us that are about to, to just rise to the top, Let's, let's make sure we accept that responsibility. I mean, you have a license to generate as much wealth as you want, but there's a duty that comes along with that. And, that, and, and you have to be responsible for that duty. They will bring you into court or they'll revoke your license. OK. 
okay, well, now that we've been sufficiently threatened, uh, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> thank you for that. But the, I mean, it, again, I mean, like you said, a lot of this just has to do with people's experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and to your point, those of us, and, and I can only speak for myself, I did not grow up around a, a whole bunch of professional people. Uh, and so when, if you knew people who were in business, they were, they were barbers, right? They were barbers. They were people who just sold things on the block. Huh, people were just hustling, right? Legally, right? But they're hustling. And so, like, there was no idea of, like, taxes. Or, it was just, again, let me get this to the consumer, turn over a couple of dollars so I could turn over some more inventory or keep, you know what I mean? It was just that kind of thing. But the real money is, is on another level. And like you said, there's a cost to be in that game. And if you don't know the rules, you sort of need a tour guide in that sense. But here's the thing. There are whatever number of attorneys in, in the United States, uh, even who do business law. I've met, you know, a couple here and there. None of them sound like you. None of them sound like you. Not just because you're black, but you seem to be very passionate about what you're doing. You seem to connect to a deeper purpose. And I suspect some of that comes from the fact that you've dealt with thousands of black entrepreneurs and you saw that there were deficits and things were missing and you decided to respond to that. I want to ask you about this. A lot of those folks were in startup stages. A lot of those folks were just getting off the ground and you kept noticing certain trends. And again, you wanted to do something about it. You've been working on a project uh, for entrepreneurs. Tell us a little bit about that project because as an attorney, you're looking at this and saying, look, man, people need this, people need that. And you decided to sort of streamline that. Tell us a little bit about, about a little about that project you're working on. Yeah, I think so. I'll tell you the passion, right? You you definitely recognize a, a passion that, and and I tell people all the time, I'm not I'm not like other attorneys. I never was in law school. I'm not now in court. It does come from a deep seated place of wanting to change people's lives, and that's the way I was. I grew up, and I say I was blessed or fortunate or lucky to be in this position. Like all my, you know, I have friends, and I look at them, I line them up, and I say. Okay, this one decided he wanted to be a rapper. This one wanted to be in gangs. This one wanted to sell drugs. This one wanted to take his basketball career or whatever career as long far as he could. Um, this one just is doing whatever he can to get by. And you go on and on, and then you have a select few that we got lucky. And then I was fortunate to have good parents, and they built a community around me that even when I stumbled myself, I was I had somebody there to pick me up and and boost, make sure I was on the right path. I'll say that. And that's not a luxury that we have in our community. Um, I was fortunate. And so when you, when you're, I think taking that with me, I felt like I always had a responsibility because even through my law, I can tell you, I have mentors. I mean, my, you know, when I started my law practice, my mentor had been practicing years and he pretty much sponsored me and mentored me and making sure that I was able to hang out my shingles and not have to worry about getting a loan from a bank. That doesn't really happen. And so, because usually you don't have the credit. Um, you're missing credit or you you have too much student loans or just a number of issues that we all suffer through as black people when we're trying to accomplish our dreams. Um, so mentors, having access to credit, having access to education. You said it, Duan. I mean, when I when I tried to start my, my business when I was in my, my 20s, like you said, it wasn't that long ago. I'm not that old, guys. Guys, I know black don't crack, but uh, I'm just not that old also. <laughs> um, I, I was trying to operate based off what I saw. <laughs> like, hey, mom. No, I'm just not starting. No. Um, I, when I started the business, I was literally the one looking at my old business books. I didn't have nobody to turn to. And I started a nonprofit also at the same time, me and my buddies, because of the hurricane that impacted my community at that time, really changed the character. So I got with Rashard Lewis, who was in the NBA, the highest paid player at that time. And I said, I'm going to do something to change the community. So these are all things that I always said, this, this is my responsibility because I shouldn't be here. I should be no different than my friend who's still serving time because we used to run together. And he just made one decision. And maybe I made the same decision to get caught. I'm not saying I did, but that's, that's the reality of people who look like us. And so law allowed me to use my career and my profession to help people who were going through similar situations. Now, the project I'm working on, I said, it's not enough. Um, because you see thousands of entrepreneurs, even the ones that I've been able to touch personally, but even the ones I've researched across the country, they're all going through that same problem. You're, we all, all of them don't have the luxury and the communities in which they're raised to have somebody to take them along and say, you know what, I'll show you a pathway for your dream by being a mentor, or I'll help sponsor you as a coach, 
or I will help you finance your dream based on um, you know my credit that I have, whether it's as a person, as a professional, as a business owner, I will lend it to you in a, in a democratic fashion so that now you can go on and have your own law practice and you're now you're not relying on anybody but that's what happened to me personally and that's what even what we've been able to do in the past 10 years when i'm working at the entrepreneurship center uh, with thousands and countless of other people who feel the same way so i created a company called equal liberty um, i've been working on it for almost really 10 years now inspired by an economist by the name of lewis kelso um, he was responsible for the employee um, stock ownership plan for you know that was created like in the mid 80s which is basically designed to give employees more more investments into the companies they were working for so that they they would see the perceived value and hopefully the company would generate more um more profit and then essentially the employees would get a piece of that and that's that was like a shared ownership plan and i was like this is brilliant and so he had something called binary economics where you look at an, a market or an economy and you say if you can find a way to give every player inside that market the tools and resources they need to survive on their own without taking away from somebody else's property. Then you can you can you can boost their production, and then they will have more of a surplus to trade in the marketplace. And so I don't want to go into the, the geeky economic stuff because that's not my field. But and even in a practical sense, that's what we're looking at. Even when we look at the fact that we got 1.4 trillion dollars that's in our economy but it's all based on consumer spending and it's not always based on production or it's not based on production. But if we can give all those people who are spending those dollars, the tools and resources they need in order to go and participate, then I think we'll, we'll see a beautiful change. And, and obviously you and your We Buy Black team have been already encouraging this. And so what I want, what I'm, what I'm doing with Equal Liberty is going into local communities and giving them all those resources I talked about that people gave me, access to education, access to mentors and coaches but more importantly we're democratizing the access to capital in that process so for those who want to go and dream big who want to 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 to, to create a better life and create wealth and solve the problems in their community we're going to give them the tools and resources at their doorstep in their local community through equal liberty and we'll, we'll be starting in labor day and we're starting here in houston texas and we hope to go into every black community making sure they have the tools and resources and the goal I hope that we have uh, countless people go through this program, um, build their credibility, make sure they, they're able to build the local economy and then go participate like in the greater economy, like a We Buy Black Marketplace and other similar situated in making sure that we not only continue to spend 1.4 trillion, but now everybody has an ability to create wealth on that. Um, because I'll say this, um, in the past, we didn't think we deserve an opportunity to create wealth. Not, not every black person, I'll tell you, it's even people in my family, people close to me. I was just fortunate to get this, this, opti this sense of optimism. But creating wealth should not be a night, it shouldn't be a nice to have. It's a birthright. And that's what we believe in equal liberty. So, yeah, I got excited. And I, and I just found out about what you're doing and, and you were telling me about it. And I, and I really just thought it was a dynamic possibility for particularly young people to from your smartphone be able to access everything that you're not accessing <laughs> as a you know like growing up in the hood or whatever you, you don't have business incubators and accelerators reaching out to you you don't have you know what i mean but if i have a smartphone now with equal liberty so when you told me about it, i was like okay we, we we need to at least let folks know this this is happening i mean I, I just think it's dynamic but it comes from a place of you working with all these entrepreneurs as an attorney and realizing like here's all the information people don't have let me get it to people let me give folks access i i think it's I think it's a dope project, man. I think it's really exciting. So I want people to connect with you, first of all. So why don't you give folks, how do people connect with you? Like, you know, if people want to reach out, you know, how do they get to you? Absolutely. Um, I look forward to it. Uh, right now you can reach me um, on Instagram uh, at Gates Law Office. And so on social media, I encourage you to follow me, uh, Y-A-T-E-S Law Office. You'll, you'll find my, my law firm profile. You can also reach me on my personal profile, which is PJY underscore Equal Liberty. Um, equal Liberty is a, word, a term I, I, I kind of phrase 
and it's based on equilibrium and liberty, uh, just kind of marrying economics with the law and really finding a, a equilibrium between pr um, producers and consumers in the marketplace. And so that's spelled E-Q-U-I-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y. And so you can find me at PJY underscore Equilibrity. And then uh, Equilibrity itself has Find Equilibrity, which will be our social media platform driving people um, to this new, this new company that we're talking about here, uh, Equilibrity. And, you know, through this conversation, what I've realized, and I've I'm, I'm honestly been learning as I'm talking to you. Uh, <laughs> first of all, the modern day freedom fighter is a business attorney, a black business attorney. I'm learning that. Secondly, I'm learning every entrepreneur, regardless of what phase you're in, needs a good attorney. I honestly thought that was something you get to later when you, when you have a bunch of money and you're saying no. Now, I hope I don't get you into trouble because we have not talked about this at all. <laughs> but in my head, I'm honestly, in my head, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm a black entrepreneur and I don't know a good attorney and I don't think I can afford a good attorney, but I have a really amazing idea and this thing is going somewhere, I'd probably call you and pitch you uh, a piece of equity in my company for a couple hours of your time. I think it would be worth it. If, if you can help me get things to where they need to be to where I'm going to make a bunch of money, I wouldn't mind giving you 10% of my company because I would have never gotten there without you. Now, again, Philip may say, no, don't call me with that. But I'm just saying, me as an entrepreneur, I would think to myself, you know what, let me get creative because every entrepreneur needs an attorney, especially someone like you who has a passion for this. And like you said, you feel like you have an obligation to the community. That's, that's not every attorney. That, that's just not every attorney. So I, I guess in closing, what I really want you to communicate to people is why you do this work. Like, forget the scripts, forget what's on your, work, your website. Why do you do this every day? Yeah, um, you said it best. It's my responsibility. I really believe it's my responsibility to pay it forward. I can't emphasize enough that I've been in your position. So I'm speaking to all the entrepreneurs that, that watch this um, for, for, for days and months and years to come. When they go back to this webinar, you want a lawyer that's been through the journey. And I've been through the journey as an entrepreneur of small business. I've been through the journey of starting technology companies, starting funds. And, and I've been through the journey of, of just being in a place where you felt alone, like you didn't have any resources to turn to. And, and so in the earlier parts, and as I explained earlier, I did it by myself. And that's not the way to go. You need a team on the journey. And I want to be on your team. And although I may not be the attorney for you, I can be an advisor. And that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years. And, and through Equal Liberty, I'll be doing it for years to come until God calls me home because that's just my passion. If we can work something out, obviously, I, I would love to be the general counsel for your company. Like I have so many other companies that I'm working with um, right now that are a perfect fit for me. But I may not be the perfect fit, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from each other. And that's what, that's what Equal Liberty is about, is co-creating. And I think that's what I love about this, you know, this Africa in August. That's what I love about We About Black. And I love everything we're doing together, Duan, is that I want them to reach out to me because we can co-create that solution so that you're on the right path. Because if you win, we all win. And that's really my, my message. And that's my motto. If the more people look like me that win, it makes it easier for me to walk into court. It makes it easier for me to walk into that boardroom. It makes it easier for me even to walk into a bankruptcy court where the others have been using that as a tool. And I can go on and on about my experiences, but I want it to be easy for us to all create wealth where it's no longer a, a talk about being a freedom fighter. It's talk about, man, they got a good old boy system over there. I want us to be the one they get mad at one day where they say, they built such a, a tight community, man. I envy them. So they're not talking about, you know, whether this culture or this community or this religion and that they just do it right those days are gone it's our time well ladies and gentlemen this is mr philip yates and again i'm, I'm yeah i'm blown away this is mr philip yates attorney at law law office of yates and associates that's y-a-t-e-s yates and associates also the founder of equal liberty i want to thank you for taking some time with us tonight man i really appreciate it Thank you, Dewan. I really enjoyed the conversation and thank you to the We Buy Black community for having me. All right. Good night. <laughs>